History 1302, The Progressive Era, 1865 to 1900, Part 2. This is going to be Part 2 part of three parts. So in Part 1, we've established our thesis statement. The law has not caught up with industrialization. And again, let me reiterate, we have to put our society under our system of laws. We've got to put a lot of people under a lot of pressure before they're willing to change the law. The Industrial Revolution took place in the uh, early 1800s, the early 19th century, uh, with the perfection of the steam engine and its widespread use. And that sort of changed manufacturing. It started slowly and then it moved up. But it turned our economy from an agriculturally based economy with agriculturally based laws, which had always been the law going back to Roman times, to something new, an, an, an industrial, an industrial based economy with a need for industrial laws. Now, Britain had gone through this. I've mentioned this several times before. They're about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ahead of us in this dynamic of the law catching up with industrialization. And a good example of that is the Saddle Report. I've talked about that before, and I'll talk about that again. So to put, to get the law to catch up, catch up with industrialization, we have to put our entire society under a lot of pressure. We start out with agriculture and how it industrialized and how the farmers are producing, producing, producing and getting less and less and less for their money. And that puts them under a lot of pressure. We talked about industry at the end of the Civil War. At the end of the war, industry usually goes down at the end of a war because of all the um, cancellation of military contracts, for example. But in this particular case, in the 1860s, 1870s, industry actually went up after the Civil War. Uh, railroad building, um, the building of larger and larger uh, industrial base, and just issue after issue caused the economy to uh, become more industrialized. There's a huge change in the economy, certainly, but instead of going down, it either stayed level in some industries or increased dramatically. So we also talked about the labor force at the end of the Civil War and how they're under a lot of pressure. We had children in the labor force. We talked about that extensively, and we'll talk about that again. Uh, we'll talk about low pay and how that's working out. We'll talk about how a great treasure of money is being made, but the workers themselves are not getting any of it. They're being stomped on. I've talked about immigration, a new wave of people, and they have come to America with high expectations, and then reality is a monstrosity. It's horrible. Moving forward, we'll talk about politics, the corruption of self-interest. We'll talk about the economic theory and the ultra-rich. Again, don't go to sleep on that. Uh, we will talk about middle class, the dynamo of change. I'll have a lot to say on that. And then the political ramifications, the law catches up with industrialization. So with all that in mind, uh, here we go. So this is sort of a macro view. This is a macro view. Industrialized America in the age of progressivism. So the triangles that you see there, I want you guys to be thinking of that as a pyramid. And kind of that blue arrow at the bottom pointing towards uh, what these triangles then represent. Coal mining, steel, petroleum, meat packing, textile, railroads, on and on and on. All these hundreds, dozens and dozens and dozens of different industries. At the very apex of the pyramid, up there where that black arrow is at, it points out what we all know to be true. And again, I've talked about this before. Um, when we talked about Charles Beard. He says that the Constitution promotes this idea of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. That it's an economic document. So here we have it. Industrialists and management staff, 2% of the workforce, 90 to 90% of all the wealth in America. In a country that's becoming fabulously, fabulously wealthy. All this money is being trapped at the top. Now, I do have a note on there, and please, you know, make a strong note here. The rich, wealthy elite are almost entirely focused upon making more money. Almost never do you see one actually going into politics. And we'll talk about that going forward. Um, the idea is that they feel, the rich, wealthy elite feel, that if they actually need anything politically done, they can go buy a politician. But the real issue here is the law has not caught up with industrialization. 
So if you're really, really super wealthy, super, super, super rich, uh, you feel that the law does not touch you, which in large measure was true. And so you can do whatever you wanted. So as for the rest of the pyramid, it's that kind of a uh, red arrow there. Workers greatly desire political change to minimize the differences between the haves and haves nots. Now, this is also critical. This is an element of a political movement called populism. Nobody wants to rob the rich to give to the poor. Everybody feels like in America, everybody feels that you should be able to rise in America to the heights that your talents will take you. Everybody feels that very strongly. So nobody wants to actually rob the rich and give to the poor. Nobody wants that. But they do want the distance between the poor and the rich to be minimized. They want to shrink that up. At a time when, and we've talked about this before, many, many people, especially you know, industrial workers, they're living in like terrible, terrible conditions. They're in these overcrowded cities. They're packed in. They're treated like rats. And they know that there's a bad attitude at the top, that they are rats, that they're just, you know, the great unwashed. But everybody in America knows that that's how the rich, wealthy elite, that's kind of how they started. They were way down there on the food chain. And then through their own efforts, everybody admits to that. They got to the top. And so that picture in the uh, upper left, uh, you can see the guy with that big uh, dark mustache. That's J.P. Morgan. And down there at the very bottom, here are all these giants. And, you know, this Lilliputian figure is, like, going to go out there and tangle with them, going to fight, trying to even up the score. The picture that you see kind of in the center, the lower center, uh, this is, you know, the unwelcome guest at dinner. So this is the, the, the cousin of the rich, wealthy elite, and he's coming to dinner, and he wants a place at the table. And though he may be a cousin, the rich, wealthy elite are saying, no, 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 go away. Last but not least, you see a populist party, and it's all about busting up trust. Uh, the guy in the red shirt there, I'm pretty sure that that's uh, William Jennings Bryant. And um, he's um, he's got a jar there next to him made of silver, and he was, like, against that. So he's got the, the jar is symbolically bottled up. And he's pushing away uh, the trust busters. William Jennings Bryant was a populist, but he also said, listen, let businesses do what they're doing. And so this, we're starting to see um, the little people, the people at the very bottom, they're starting to take note of what's really going on, and they're, they're showing their dislike. So again, in the macro, our society is becoming alive to the idea that they're under a lot of pressure, and that it's really, really unfair what's going on, and they don't like it. They want political change. So with that in mind, let's go on to uh, the next one, and we're going to start talking about um, the transition. We're going to start talking about political parties. Now, labor, I want to be clear on this. Labor stays the same for about 50 years there. And this goes all the way back to the 1840s and then goes on to really the 1890s, so about 50 years there. And this exemplifies why labor is under such pressure, why they're so upset. So strong notes on this one. Again, if I give you a slide with a lot of verbiage on it, you better take good notes. So the average worker, for a man, it's $1.50 a day. For the average worker, women, about $1 a day. For children, $0.50 cents or less. Now let's just kind of stop right there and think about this. If you're, if there's no laws saying who you can hire and how you can hire them and, you know, how long you can keep them, there's no contract there at all. Then if you can put a child in the workplace, you will because they're cheap. The Saddle Report found that out. They're cheap. Children will tend to do what adults tell them to do. They'll work and not really understand what's going on. And they, you know, a lot of pressure being put on children. Because their family is starving. And so many children would say, rather than go to school, because they would be asked this. In the salary report, they would be asked this. They would say, no, I'd rather be at work because my family is starving. 
but they're only going to make like 50 cents a day at a time when the day was from sunup till sunset. Observe that picture in the upper left. The reason why it's sun up to sun, sun up to sundown is because there's no light bulbs. They haven't been invented yet. Nobody has electricity. So as you can see right next to those kids, you got these big giant windows. And that lets in illumination. That lets in, lets in light. So as long as there's light outside, those people are going to be working. But again, what's important here is if you can put a child into that job, then you do. And this puts women and men, the real breadwinners, you would think, at a disadvantage. Again, if you if a child couldn't do the job, well, can a woman do that job? Because they're cheaper. And so the last person that you want to hire is a man because they're expensive. Only the most hard, backbreaking, difficult, you know, physical jobs go to men. Furthermore, let's go on down to the rest of this. There's no benefits. Today we would think of, okay, you're going to get some kind of health care insurance or you're going to get a 401k. Those are all inventions of the late 20th century. You're not going to get any of that. No unions. At the time, they were called combinations. Okay, I have a union. They are illegal at the time because the rich, wealthy, and elite made them illegal. They said, listen, we're going to go to our politicians. And this is one of those a few examples. We'll go to the politicians and say, listen. We're not interested in having the poor or our workers have any say at all. So make unions illegal. Well, that's that's unconstitutional. You have the right to free assembly. But Congress went through with it because the rich told them to do that. No safety standards. Again, you know, children in the mines. We saw that picture before of this kid standing on a machine. Uh, there's no safety standards at all. So a million worker deaths or injuries a year in the 1880s, 1890s. A million worker deaths a year at a time when our population was about 125 million. So the chances are if you're in the working class, somewhere along the line, you're going to get really, really badly injured or quite possibly killed. Everything was really, really dangerous and nobody cared. You know, the rich wealthy, they don't care. They have no liability for that. That's a 20th century thing. No child labor restrictions, 12 to 14 work day, hour work days. We've talked about that just now. Six days a week. Don't forget this is six days a week. Saturday was not a day off. Half an hour lunch, unpaid, unrestricted layoffs, broken time. Broken time goes like this. You might go to somebody and say, listen, I want a job. And they say, well, okay, we've got an opening for you. And it's this much money a day, and you're going to be paid once a week. You're a man. You're going to be $1.50 a day. You're going to be paid once a week. Okay, so you're there Monday through Saturday. Saturday's going to be payday. Fine. So along comes Wednesday, and your supervisor comes to you and says, Hey, listen, it just turns out that we're so caught up in everything. Uh, you know, everything's going really well. We just don't have any work for you today. So go ahead and take the day off. And you say, well, I would rather not do that. And they say, nope, go take the day off. Okay, fine. So then when Saturday comes along and you are lined up at the, at, the, at the pay desk and you stick your hand out and say, well, listen, I'm ready for my pay. They will look you right in the eye and say, no, because you didn't work six days this week. You only worked five. You were gone for a day. So no pay for you this week. Obviously, your response is, no, I was told to go home. I wanted to stay here, but I was told to go home. No, you, the deal was you got to work six days a week. And so you can see how people were really, really furious with this. But what would the factory guy say? Look, there's the door. Hit it. Get out. Go. You're fired. Get out. Because I've got 20 guys waiting outside the gate to get your job. Workers learn to knuckle under and take it. Because the factory people would say, okay, we stuck it to that guy this week. The next week is somebody else's turn. And the week after that, it's that guy over there. And the week after that, it's this person over here. But think how much money the factory is making on that. They're getting a week's worth of labor for free if they could just stick it to their workers. So, you know, workers are under a lot of pressure that way. And there's no legal recourse. That means you can't sue anybody. 
the law hadn't caught up with industrialization. There's no law against these sorts of things. You can clearly see how these are illegal. They're certainly immoral. But that's not the same as having a law on your side. The law is not caught up with industrialization. I have there at the bottom, again, also consider the Saddle Report. Uh, for those of you who do not get this, uh, the Saddle Report, really quickly on this. Michael Sadler was a member of Parliament. I've mentioned before that the same things that are happening in America had happened in Britain about 10 years before. So Britain is about 10 years ahead of us in terms of the reaction to the Industrial Revolution. So in the 1840s and 1850s, this member of Parliament, Michael Sadler, developed this report. He sent out a, a series of researchers, and they interviewed everyone. And the Sadler report, to be clear, is online. All you got to do is type it in, do a Google search. It will come right up. And it will tell you the most horrifying stories. Uh, they will go talk to parents, and they'll say, are your children in the workforce? And the parents will say, yes, they are. Why? Because we're starving. We need the money. So we have to put our children into the workforce. Then we go to the children and say, well, would you rather be at work or at school? And the children would say, I'd rather be at work. Well, why? This is hard, back-breaking work, and you're like here all the time, and it's like, this is not, this is not fun. And the children would invariably say, or almost invariably say, my family is starving. They need my money. Think of the psychological weight that that puts onto a child. Uh, they would talk to some of the what they call minders. You and I would call them my first line supervisor, my manager or whatever. But in those days, they called them a minder. And they would be in one of these factories and they would say, okay, well, how long have you been in the factory? Well, 10 years. Well, how old are you? 17. So he'd been in the factory since he was seven. And what's critical about this is violence, something that we wouldn't put up with today. And they would say to this minder, well, uh, when you were a worker, were you ever beaten? And they would say, yes. Well, now that you're grown up and you're a minder, do you beat these kids? And they would say, yes. Well, why do you beat them? Because I don't want them to fall asleep and fall into the equipment and get hurt. I don't beat them out of pleasure. I don't. I beat them so they don't fall asleep and get hurt. I'm trying to help them, which is heartbreaking. And in one factor, they said, well, what's the alternative if you don't want to beat them? Well, dunking. We have a tank of water over there in the corner of the factory, ice cold water. And I take one of these six, seven, eight-year-old kids and just jerk him up by the feet and plunge him headfirst in that bar barrel of water. And that will tend to wake them up. They would say to the kids, do you get food? Well, mom and dad would pack some food for me, yeah, but it's like we don't have enough money for a lunch pail or something like that. So it just sits over on the windowsill and gets messed up. There's all kinds of you know, filth on it when I get ready to eat. So I usually don't eat it. And so it's one thing after another, after another, after another. And the result of the saddle report, in 1830, they have this big, giant reform law, the reform law of 1830. And they get rid of a lot of this. The Saddle Report worked. And so in Britain, not entirely, but for the most part, the law begins to catch up with industrialization. Well, in America, we're going to do everything but the right thing until uh, there's just no alternative but to do the right thing. And it's going to take us all the way till 1890 to get this caught up. But this is, what the, this is the sort of stress that I'm talking about. And you see it in all the cartoons. You see it in what people are doing. Uh, the, the cartoon down there at the bottom in the, on the, uh, what would it be, on the left, with the fist raised up, this is this trend towards union. In the upper right, again, you see children, like, down in the sewage system, putting together sewage pipes. That's what's going on there. And then a cartoon saying, well, here's big business, and we're actually running Congress. And there you see Columbia, and she's saying, no, you don't. You know, the American people run Congress. And the rich guy's saying, well, you know, come and take it. He's got bags of money in his pocket. He's got a big giant cigar. He's like, look, I can do whatever I want. Yes? So people knew what was happening at the time, and our society is under enormous stress. 
So with that in mind, let's continue to talk about, let's transition and continue to talk about politics and why, in other words, what what is the next stressor? And this is all about politics. So very briefly here, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I want you guys to understand what the political parties, in broad terms, what they stood for. And at a glance, uh, take a look at the issues. And these are the issues that, in many ways, with few exceptions, these are the issues that affect us even today. So are we going to have a strong central government? Well, the opposite of that, listen to me carefully, take a careful look at the slide. The opposite of a strong central government is not no central government. The opposite of strong central government is strong states. Power will reside somewhere. Power will not put up with a vacuum. So it's either a strong central government or strong states. And this is a debate that had gone back in our history all the way to 1787 with the Articles of Confederation going and the Constitution that we have now emerging. And in many ways, this there's always a strong resistance to a strong central government. Nobody wants that. But then the states, you know, the states seem to get weaker and weaker and weaker every year. Anytime there's a problem, we don't look to... In Texas, where I'm at, they don't. We don't look to Austin and the governor to like solve anything. There's probably you know two or three or four people in ten who don't even know who the governor of the state of Texas is. So strong central government versus strong states. We don't want a strong central government, but then, as it turns out, we do. Strong states. Well, that was an issue at the time. That is not in a way that we understand today. So this is going to be a constant tension. Um, the next issue, antitrust. The opposite of that is laissez-faire. And I'll have a slide on that later on. Laissez-faire means to leave it alone. It means no government involvement in business. Antitrust, which is anti-monopoly. And you have the government going out there and dealing with monopolies. Versus laissez-faire, which is... Let the economy do whatever it wants. No government involvement in the economy. So antitrust also goes with worker protection. And you can see on the Democratic side, there's like nothing like that. They're like, look, look, let your conscience be your guide. If you go to work and you live, fine. Then, you know, cup's half full. If you go to work and you get all mangled up, well, cup's half empty. You know, try to do something about it yourself. So antitrust and worker protection, that kind of goes together. The next issue, gold standard versus silver standard. Now, this was a huge issue at the day. And this it's kind of hard money versus soft money. Part of this goes back to Western migration. I mentioned this before in Western migration, that we have this vast influx of gold and silver into the economy. It's available. And that had never been the case in America. We'd always have been a not a cash-poor society, but we didn't have enough gold and silver to really run the economy. In other words, you get a little bit of gold and silver out there running the economy, and then a lot of paper money, which was thought of as soft money. Then along came Western migration and all that vast treasure of gold getting into the economy, and so we finally had enough gold and silver to actually make that into hard money. Now, soft money also has a, another meaning. It means dollars, paper money, that cannot be redeemed in gold and silver. Versus hard money, which is paper money, but it can be. It's backed by gold or silver. You could take it down to the bank and say, listen, this is a silver certificate or a gold certificate. And so I have this much of it, and I want it in, back in silver. And the bank has to do that. So that then is hard money. And is one of those going to be destabilizing? Is going to be is does what? Which one promotes stability? So this is going to be a big debate at the time. This is a huge issue at the time that we don't even understand today. Uh, if you're really uh, more interested in this, which is going to be a huge debate, I'm telling you, uh, make sure you take a look at the book. The book covers this. They give it almost a half a chapter, three or four pages on nothing but gold standard versus silver standard. So um, strong central government is going to promote high tariffs. This is an import or an export tax, and they like that. They really do like that. They want that. They want a protectionist tariffs, and they want to maintain that. 
the Democratic Party with strong states and therefore a weak central government, they want low tariffs. Ironically, they want a free market. Just let, let the markets go where they're going to go. So no protectionism, you know, it's just raw capitalism, dog eat dog. The Republican Party are going to have a, an appeal to the middle class, the Democratic Party, an appeal to the rich ruling elite. That's the way it had always been. Now, another issue is um, more important as we go forward, an end to isolationism, and that means more foreign involvement. And that will be the Republican Party way at the end of the century. McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft. So they don't like isolation, those guys didn't. That's way at the end of the century, and we'll talk about them later. The Democratic Party platform still says, no, America first, America second, America last, America always. And ignore everybody else. No international ploys, no international contacts, nothing. It's just us and to hell with everyone else. So for those of you guys who are more or less politically astute, please understand I'm not trying to confuse you. But this is exactly the opposite of the way the parties are now. The issues, except for, say, a gold standard and a silver standard, high tariffs versus low tariffs, those issues are almost identical to the way they are today. It's just that the parties associated with them are exactly the opposite. So in this slide, I'm giving you the big macro ideas. And these are macro ideas that have been with us all the way since the beginning of the United States of America, all the way back during the Revolution. Many of these issues had, had already emerged then. Strong, ish, strong central government versus strong states. That, had issued, that, that issue had been around since the Revolution. But here we are in the 1860s to the 1890s, and these are the issues that really do energize the electorate. So just a real quick, take a look at the pictures down below. The Republican Party, uh, they're seen as this uh, elephant, and it is a metaphor. Now, you don't have to write this down, but do keep an eye on this because you're going to need it later on. If you have a big, giant, strong central government, then it is this big, giant, bloated animal. And that's kind of what's going on here. That elephant kind of towards the middle of the slide, that's Thomas Nast again. And we see this guy everywhere. I'm telling you right now, he's a very famous cartoonist. But an elephant is enormous. It's huge. It's giant. It's got teeny tiny little eyes. You can't really see where it's going. It might be clumsy and bumbling. And so that's where... The Republican Party, that's where they got their iconography. The Democratic Party, the donkey, that had emerged uh, before the Civil War as a party identifier. And uh, especially Jackson. He said, what? That's going to be our party like icon? Okay, I'll take that. He actually agreed with that. Because a donkey kicks and squeals and fights and bites and they're like, they can be really vicious animals. And so, sure enough, uh, there you see that donkey right there in the middle. Uh, he's kicking the crap out of this lion who represents big government or whatever he represents. Uh, there's a vulture in the tree in the background waiting to, like, you know, eat whoever survives or whoever dies. And then the Capitol Dome is in the far background. And so, again, that's a Thomas Nast cartoon. And we will run into him again later. And he's just showing this, this, this donkey just, like, kicking out wildly. The other cartoon is from a, a magazine called Puck, P-U-C-K, and uh, this is a different illustration toward the end of the century. And you can see some of the older political figures. Uh, I know you guys have no idea about this, but Benjamin Butler is in there. Uh, Grover Cleveland is in there. Some of the other politicians. And they're shoeing the donkey with shoes that the donkey would not ordinarily wear. And that's kind of an indication that the, the party's in transition, which is a very good cartoon as we go into the 1880s, 1890s. And if you could take a close look at it, you'll see that the donkeys were getting these shoes that he doesn't like, and he's crying and bawling, and he doesn't like it. But um, the politicians are embracing issues that they want. 
So there's a lot of party upheaval here. These are the political icons. But again, uh, the change will come in the Taft administration. But these are the major events that are affecting America at the time frame we're talking about. Your book will talk about every bit of this a lot. So let's find out the stress here. Let's find out where the stress is at. The stress is here. Strong notes here. Super strong notes here. 1870s, 1880s, we recognize we uh, we have uh, a dynamic here of the rise of the cities, which we've talked about earlier on. And because of the rise of this urban population, we also have the rise of political machines. These go hand in hand. Strong note. The rise of cities, the emergence of a lot of cities, goes hand in hand with the rise of political machine. Tammany Hall is the worst offender. It's New York, but I have it underlined up there, bold, in a different font, and everything. Every city had a machine. Missouri had a political machine. Seattle was a big, giant political machine. There were political machines in San Francisco. Dallas and Fort Worth, at the time, I'm telling you, had a political machine. There's political machines are in every town and city. But we need to zoom in a little bit. So let's go to the worst offender, the worst of the worst. It's called Tammany Hall. It's also referred to as the Tammany Ring. And this is a, it's, it's backing the Democratic Party, but it's not, it's working for the interests of just a very few people. They're claiming to be Democrats. They're not really. They're in it for themselves. So an example of that is the construction of the New York State House. So let me just like kind of start right there. Tammany Hall, this political machine, went to all their constituents, their voters, and said, we want you to vote for a new state house. And all the voters said, well, okay, we will do that. Ray, woo, democracy, we want a new state house. That's what we want. So then Tammany Hall says, listen, the people want a new state house. So we have to do that. That's the will of the people. But it's highly manipulative. In other words, the way the Democratic machine, Tammany Hall, got control of those voters is they would do some microscopic little something for a group or maybe for a few individuals. And then they would say, listen, you've got to vote the way I want you to vote when I tell you to vote that way. For example, if you're a new immigrant just coming off the boat from, let's say, Germany, and you'll say you'll send a guy out there saying, hey, you're a bunch of Germans, or maybe you're of a Jewish population. You're a bunch of Jewish people. Do you guys need jobs? Do you need to get through the immigration process? And they would all say, yes, we need to do that. Okay. So the Tammany Hall agent would slip the immigration guys 20 bucks and say, get all these people through right now. Bang, and they were through. Then the Tammany Hall guy would say, well, listen, do you need a place to stay? And they would all say, yes. Well, then you take them to Little Italy or... Uh, the Jewish part of town, or Chinatown, or you would take them to the German part of town, or whatever, the Irish part of town, the five points. And you'd say, okay, we've got a place for you to stay, and we've got to work, we've got to work for you. We'll find somebody to like give you some work and give you some place to stay. But in, turn, in return for every bit of this, you've got to vote the way I want you to vote. And that worked perfectly. So the construction of the New York State House took 13 years to build. 13 years? That's just stupid. You know, it didn't take 13 years. They're milking the project. Multiple false contractors. These are not names that I made up. One of the contractors was called T.C. Cash. Another one is Philip F. Dummy. These are made-up corporations. They're made-up companies. They're supposed to... They're supposed to supply something to the state house to build it and they don't supply anything they don't exist but they get paid furnished yes three tables 40 chairs 179,739 dollars to change that's 179,739 dollars in 1870s dollars you know had they been made out of literally solid silver it would not have costed that much so 
it has nothing to do with the tables and the chairs. It has to do with bilking the taxpayer out of, you know, $179,739. It costs twice the price of the entire Alaska purchase. We bought all of Alaska from Russia for the price that it took to build this one building in New York. Again, these are taxpayer dollars, and they're getting funneled into this project and they're just being sucked dry. And it's being put into the hands of the Tammany Ring. The Tammany guys would say, well, uh, you know, we, the voters have voted for this. And then, this is actually true, somebody got caught in a cemetery. This seemed to be an old trick that happened a lot. Somebody got caught in a cemetery writing down names. And somebody in the cemetery said, what are you doing? And they're like, yeah, I need to like come up with some voters. So deceased persons were voting for years, and this is true. They actually said this. Tammany Hall said this. They were voting as they would if they'd still been alive. Dead people cannot vote. It's fraud. You can't do that. But this is the nature of this Tammany ring. Several signs of the declaration will still be voting in Philadelphia. Just another example of a, of a, not Tammany in this case, but of another political machine in the 1890s. The declaration was signed in 1776. So it's, you know, it's these political machines are controlling everything. So strong note here. The stress goes like this. In our system, if there is something going really, really wrong, you should be able to get your political leadership, your representative, to fix it. The stressor here in this period that we're talking about is the politicians were in it for themselves. This had disrupted the Grant administration, all those scandals, everybody's in it for themselves. We talked about that. Well, here it is in a kind of a micro, the Tammany Hall. They're in it for themselves. And so this is a, a huge stressor. Here's all these people, the haves versus the have-nots. Uh, the law is not cut up with industrialization. Everybody's under a lot of stress. They go out to their political leadership and they're like, well, screw you. You're just a little person. We don't care about you. We're in it to make money. We're in it for ourselves. And that is the stressor. So continue on with Tammany Hall. Let's talk about a specific individual. The individual here that's being, it's being run, it's a political machine. It's being run by William Boss Tweed. William Boss Tweed. And he misappropriates money. He is, is he scandalous in terms of how he uh, manipulates the political machine. The Democratic Party had gotten control of New York politics. It was scandalous the way they did that. There had been a political convention. And Boss Tweed found a way to have his organization count the votes and do the nominating. So the only nominees that were going to be voted upon were his nominees. And the only votes that were going to be counted were the votes that he and his team counted. That's it. And so that's how they got control of the entire New York apparatus. Occasionally you would have a Republican governor, but the legislation was all Democrat. And they were controlled by Boss Tweed. So the politicians are in it for themselves. And Boss Tweed is the icon of that. There's a very famous photograph, a uh, cartoon there, again, by Thomas Nash, called the Tammany Ring. And who told the people's money? Do tell. And this is uh, the New York Times. They'd run a, 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 a kind of a, a, an article on this, trying to point out this scandalous conduct. Con conduct. And the answer is, "Twas him. Well, here's all these guys. There's Boss Tweed. You could see him. And every contractor going all the way around to uh, the little guy, and this is kind of a downside for um, Thomas Nast. He did not like the Irish. And so on that particular image, you see those two guys on the far right? Those are the Irish. And Thomas Nast did not care for the Irish at all. He didn't like them. And so he always portrayed them as being basically monkey people who were easily manipulated. So everybody's pointing to everybody, and then the Irish guys are saying, well, it's the next guy, it's the next guy, it's the next guy. And those three guys that are in the middle 
those are officials that are important to the state of New York. One of them is the comptroller. The other one is the attorney general. And so these are part of the Tammany ring. Well, if the comptroller, that is the guy that basically a state secretary of treasury, if he's a Tammany ring guy, he's going to pay out the money. The comptroller is the state auditor, and he's just going to like pay out the money. And they're all tools of the Tammany ring. The middle image, again, Thomas Nash. And there is Boss Tweed in the middle. And he's like, to the victor goes the spoils. That is the caption of that cartoon. What are you complaining about? You have nothing to say. To the victor goes the spoils. And so Boss Tweed becomes like this Roman emperor. Now, Tweed did finally get caught, mostly because of the media kicking up this gigantic firestorm. And finally, he was indicted by none other than Samuel Tilden, who we've already run into. And they put him in jail, but he kind of bought his way out and escaped. He ran off to Cuba and then later on to Spain. This is true. He was identified in Spain because somebody saw these cartoons all the way in Spain. And they rearrested him there and extradited him back to New York, and he died in prison in 1878. But this is after he had made millions and millions of money in this scandalous ring. So what is the stress? People cannot trust their politicians. The politicians are in it for themselves. So here we go. The politicians are in it for themselves. And the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Let's continue on to uh, kind of examine this. So let's take a look now at the rich. Let's transition and talk about the rich. A vast treasure of money being made, and everybody knows it. Now, as I go through this, I'm going to point out some of these rich individuals. And I'm going to give you uh, some quotes so that you can kind of get an idea of how they're thinking, what they're thinking, get into their head a little bit. Let's start with John D. Rockefeller. Again, he's important in the very time frame we're talking about. 1839, he dies in 1937. I think he was like 90-something years old. But in the 1870s, 1880s, he's at the very top of his game. He's at the very top of his game. And what does he say? Competition is a sin. Rockefeller liked monopolies. Please write that down. He wanted a monopoly. And the law had not caught up with industrialization. So that was a, that was a possibility. That was a thing. I would rather earn 1% off of 100 people's effort than 100% off my own. In other words, get a whole bunch of people work for you and take a little bit from that guy and a little bit from that guy and a little bit from that guy and a little bit from that guy. And that's how you personally got rich. He knew full well he wasn't making the money himself. Other people were making the money. And he was simply basically taking it from them. God gave me all of my money. Ladies and gentlemen, God does not deal in money. He deals in souls. Now, this is called a Messiah complex. And if you look that up, you'll see a whole bunch of people out there talking about that even today. That if you get above a certain amount of money in our society, then you think, okay, well, God has done this, or I'm a tool of God. And so it was common back in those days, William Jennings Bryant is going to run a political party based on that idea. But God does not deal in money, he deals in souls. God did not give John D. Rockefeller a dime. He didn't. That's the way it is. So very briefly, how do you make this money? Vertical integration. Vertical integration. Owning and controlling every aspect of a given industry from its origin to its end user. In this case, John D. Rockefeller is going to exploit oil. He creates a company called Standard Oil. He started at the bottom, learned a lot about business, became a businessman, and he saw an opportunity and took it. Standard Oil. He called it Standard Oil because he wanted to standardize everything to streamline production. Good enough. I, I agree with that. An example of that? Well, I have a good example of it coming up. So he said, listen, what we want to do is own the wells. 
And that's an oil well there, that picture there. That's an oil well. That's what they looked like back in the day. Then the oil at the well does you no good at all. So he said the trick then is to own all the pipelines. Own the pipelines. Other people can put their oil in our standard oil pipeline, but they have to pay for that, which means their profitability is gone. Their oil, other guys, their oil is stuck at the oil well. You can't put it in John D. Rockefeller's oil pipelines to get it sent anywhere unless you pay a lot of money for that. So either build your own pipelines or haul it the old-fashioned way by a horse and wagon team. More about that in a minute. Then he says, I'm going to own all the refineries. The story goes that he went to Bayonne, New Jersey. And he said, wow, this is going to be a great place for a refinery. And we're going to put a big giant refinery here. And the mayor and the people of Bayonne said, listen, we don't want your nasty old petrochemical company in our beautiful town of Bayonne, New Jersey. Well, to make a long story short, there's a big giant refinery in Bayonne, New Jersey this very day, and it's all polluted. So John D. Rockefeller got his way. He stomped on somebody, got his way. He agrees with owning all the oil transport cars. In other words, the oil cars on the railroad, they'll be towed around by the railroads, but Standard Oil owned the car. They owned the oil transport car. He went to a series of manufacturers and said, listen, here is the exact standards. Here's the exact design that I want my oil car. They all got to be the same. The fittings have to be the same. The size has to be the same. Everything has to be exactly right. And these companies said, okay, we will build that for you exactly the way you want it done. Again, the refined oil needs to get out to the people. It has to get out to the end user. So he owned all the oil transport cars. If you wanted to send your oil, you had to send it on a standard oil car, and you had to pay for that. He designed oil barrels. Many of you that uh, listen to the markets, you're like, okay, well, oil is $55 a, a, a barrel. Crude oil, standard like crude, is $55 a barrel, or $100 a barrel, or $1,000 a barrel, or whatever it is. Usually it hovers right around $100 a barrel. Well, why 55 gallons? One of those oil barrels, an oil drum, is 55 gallons. Why not 50 gallons? Why not 60? John D. Rockefeller. He's like, it's going to be exactly this size, exactly these types of setting fittings. It's going to be built exactly in this way. And so the manufacturers all said, okay, that's what we will do. So he standardized oil barrels, 55 gallons. Petrochemical outlets, all the franchises. He wanted all that. Standard Oil still owns huge numbers of franchises under various names. So then the product gets to the end user. So Standard Oil owned everything from the time it came out of the ground, this oil, until the time the guy got it and used it. Estimated wealth at his death in 1937, 900 million dollars. Just about a billion dollars. In 1937, which was the depths of the Depression. So that would translate into many, many billions of dollars in today's money. When we talk about the rich guys that we're going to be talking about, these were the richest men who have ever, ever lived. Jeff Bezos, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. He's just now getting close to some of these guys. $900 million in 1937. God knows, I don't know that how you can really calculate that. Because of the depth of the depression, the value of the dollar is wildly hard to evaluate. So why oil? Let's ask one more question. Let's why the whys. Take a look at this. This is a standard oil field in Southern California, up above. Southern California still pumps a lot of oil. Most of those are still standard oil, oil wells. Take a careful look at the image. Scrutinize it. Take a look. Does anybody see a single automobile in that picture? So there's virtually, when he comes becomes rich on oil, there's virtually no automobiles, almost none. Ships and locomotives, they're coal-fired. 
They're not oil filed, fired. That's becoming invented. That's developing, but they still use coal by far. So lubrication needs, well, a little bit. But Rockefeller is making billions and billions of today's money on oil. So your target market has to be everyone. That's the only way you can make that kind of money. So question mark, question mark, question mark. Why all this oil? Strong note. The reason why we needed all that oil, and so that your target market is everybody, is we need lanterns for lighting. Electricity was like in its infancy as a tool for consumers. So to have light at night, you had to have lanterns. So we're not using gasoline. The automobile has not really been invented yet. Nobody's using uh, uh, diesel fuel. Diesel fuel and gasoline, this is true, those were byproducts. Gasoline is too volatile to use for anything at the time frame we're talking about, and they burned it off. It is possible, I have seen it, to have an oil well that pumps out light, sweet, crude in the form of a sort of really crude gasoline. It's possible to get gasoline straight out of the ground. Now, it's low octane. It won't burn. Uh, I've tried it before, and it's called drip, and it makes your engines smoke like crazy, and you've got to change your oil filter like, or your fuel filter like right away. But it will burn. But it was too volatile to use for anything. And so they just burned that stuff off, put it in a big, giant pit, throw in a torch. What you're looking for is what they call number two kerosene. And this is lamp oil. Sidebar, don't ever put gasoline in one of those lamps. It will blow up. It will blow up. But you needed these storm lanterns. Hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about. It's got a little tank in the bottom. You have a, a cloth wick. It's got a chimney out of glass. And you light this thing up when there's absolutely no electricity. And it will illuminate things. And it works perfectly. They work. You can buy them today. So your target market is everybody. Now think what you're doing with the product. You're burning it off. So you need a constant supply of it. Everybody in America needs it. Cities work starting to illuminate their streets. And so every day, somebody had to go up there and fill up all the little fuel tanks and every little lantern up and down the streets. And then in the morning, in the evening, they would light those things up. And then 12 or 1 o'clock at night, they would like to shut off half of them. And 6 o'clock in the morning, when the sun was coming up, they cut off the other half. So cities were buying this stuff. Individuals were buying this stuff. Strong note here. When we're talking about John D. Rockefeller and his association with oil, strong note now, he had no idea how to drill an oil well. He is not a petrochemical guy. He's not. He has no idea how to actually make and produce oil. He doesn't know how to do that. He is a businessman. He understood that there was a change in the markets. Before petrochemicals came along, we used whale oil. But all the whales are hunted out. And he recognized that there was a need for these petrochemicals for lamps. And he happened to be at the right spot at the right time to exploit that market. He is not an oil man in terms of being able to drill a hole, do the refinery, get the oil out, you know, lay out a pipeline. He doesn't know how to crack out that fuel. He doesn't know how to do that. But he knows how to mill, build a big giant, a big giant factory, a big giant corporations is what I'm trying to say, and make a vast treasure of money. Yes? Let's continue on with this idea. Let's take another look at the rich. Andrew Carnegie, 1835 to 1919. Let's get into his head a little bit. There's his picture right up there in the upper, uh, what would it be, upper left. Seems like a nice, friendly guy. I can't afford to pay them any other way. Well, how was he paying him? $1.50 a day for men, $1 a day for women, $0.50 cents a day for children. That's how he was paying them. Surplus wealth is a sacred trust with the possessors bound to administer in the lifetime for the good of the community. Who administers surplus wealth? He does. He's not going to find any mechanism or any way to get that money back into the economy. And the law was not on the side of that sort of thing. We will get to that. 
So if he's going to make a whole lot of money, a vast treasure of money, and he did, it's up to him to keep it. It's his. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully a picture is starting to form. These guys are getting rich, and there's no way to get that money out of their pockets. Wealth at his death, $380 million. That's more or less $5 trillion in today's money. It just depends on how you, uh, what currency converter that you use. There's several out there. I looked at several of them. About five trillion in today's money. You know, it's hard to understand how much uh, Jeff Bezos is worth. A hundred billion dollars, something like that. Or Bill Gates. You know, a few hundred, a few tens of billions of dollars, how much they are. But he's at five trillion. One trillion is that thousand billions so we're talking about some of the richest men who have ever existed ever going back all the way back to Roman times where if you were the Roman Emperor you owned all of Europe that sort of thing up above that picture going um, kind of across is called a panoramic photograph uh, you use a sort of a really wide-angle lens and these were really popular back in the day but that's the Homestead Steelworks, and we'll get to that. So there's a change in the industry that Andrew Carnegie is going to take advantage of. He's associated with steel, and he's going to take advantage of a change in the industry. So let's just take a couple of minutes and talk about that on the next slide. So the change is the Bessemer process. Henry Bessemer, he's an English guy. And he says what you do is you uh, charge one of these big giant um, vessels. You can kind of see it in that lower picture on the, uh, what would it be, the right side. That's the vessel kind of laying on its side. Counterclockwise, you have a vessel kind of laying on its side and another one standing right up on its bottom. And that bright part of the image there, that is the best of process in action. So to the uh, colored illustration, this is a new development. I'm going somewhere with this, so you know, kind of minimal notes on Bessemer process, just so you know, as long as you know what the result is. When you're making iron, you're going to have to melt it. You heat it way, way up with coke, and that's a type of coal. So you take this taconite out of the ground, take the coal, melt the taconite to smelt it. Then when it's in a molten state, you charge this big giant tank. And then, ladies and gentlemen, you stand it on its bottom and shoot air in at the bottom. Well, you have heat, an ignition source. That's the molten metal. Then you have oxygen, the air going in under huge pressure. These two years or turrets. They are valves that will open under the air pressure, but then not let the metal back through. In other words, they're basically one-way valves. And when the air pressure is high enough, the valve will open, and the air just shoots up into this molten steel. So you have, so you have heat, ignition, you have oxygen, the fuel, ladies and gentlemen. This is the impurities in the iron. The fuel is the impurities of the iron. And they will come blowing out in all these sparks, these big giant fountains of sparks. So what are you getting? Strong note. Up to this point in you know, metallurgy, steel was really a, uh, a, a, a difficult process to create. It's a blacksmith in a blacksmith shop taking iron and hammering it and hammering it and hammering it. And heating it up and hammering it again and heating up and hammering it again. So it's very artesian. It's an art form to make actual steel. But here we're mass producing the stuff. You take the iron ore, melt it down, pour it in, run this oxygen through it. It blows out all the impurities. And so you'll have, you know, two or three or four or five tons of steel created in one batch. Strong note, the need for steel was almost unlimited. 
We're going towards the high point, the apex of the Industrial Revolution. So everything before had been built out of iron, which will rust, it's weak, it will fracture. There's a lot of negatives to building stuff out of iron. Well, now we need steel, and not just a little bit, we need a lot of it. In other words, and I have it up there, particularly in railroads. we got to get rid of old construction, particularly in railroads. So if the railroad track, which have been around since the 1830s, was made out of iron, it has rusted. It's damaged up. You can't use it anymore. It's not malleable. And so it has to be replaced with steel. So 90,000 miles of track, which is 180,000 miles of steel rail, has to be like put in. It has to be replaced. Locomotives, they'll start making those out of iron and brass and start making them out of steel. They'll be have greater longevity. The steel will take much more pressure than iron will. So you can drive up the pressure in a steam engine. Another place is uh, ships. Ships are starting to stop building them out of wood, and we're going to begin building them out of steel. It was a short period when they were built out of iron, but iron in salt water does not work really well. So we want to build ships out of steel, steel hulls and steel frames. And so the demand for this product was unlimited. But Carnegie got, he got control of the supply. He built up all, he got all the steel industries that he could, and he collected them. And made one big giant steel company, United Steel. And then he got control of this process and said, if you need steel for new construction, you got to come to me. You want to build a bridge over the Mississippi River? That's fine. We'll build it out of steel. He actually took that project on. The bridge is still standing as far as I know, but he monopolized the steel industry at a time when the demand was unlimited. Continue on with strong notes. Carnegie did not know anything about mining that taconite. taconite. I can't speak today. Carnegie did not know anything about mining taconite. He did not have anything to do with the Bessemer process developing it. That was Henry Bessemer and some French scientists back in Europe. He didn't know anything about turning steel into a product like railroad iron. He didn't know that. He's not an engineer. He's not a chemist. He's a businessman. And he's exploiting this demand for this new process, this new uh, process for making steel. That's how he made his money. He's not a steel man. He's a businessman. Let's continue on with that idea. Now, this is a different sort of um, business model, horizontal integration. In other words, when we talk about Vanderbilt and Gould, who are the two icons here, we're not talking about guys that are going to go, out, go, to go out and build a railroad, put in the tracks, get the right-of-way going, understand how locomotives are built, get a control of the cars. They don't do that. Once the railroad is already built and up and running, then they get control of the railroad. And that's horizontal integration. Uh, for those of you guys who have ever played the board game Monopoly, hopefully all of you have, there are four railroads on it. Uh, was it B&O, Reading, Pennsylvania, and Short Line? And if you have all four railroads, a monopoly, and then you land on it, ah, it costs you a lot of money. So these guys would own a huge giant region and own all the railroads in that region. Cornelius Vanderbilt, sort of uh, the north, I'm sorry, the southeast. He'd owned all those railroads in the southeast. He owned them all. Jay Gould, railroad mogul, kind of the northeast. You know, B&O, Short Line, Reading, Pennsylvania Railroad. Those are all actual real railroads. And he's going to own them all. Well, there's no alternative to long-distance travel or long-distance freight movement. There's no real competition with it here. Unless you're near a port city, you could use sail. But in America, in the, the landward side, if you will, there's no competition to railroads. They're the only way. Big giant trucks and stuff like that have not been invented yet. That's like way, way in the future. So if you want 
rail passenger service, which was not very profitable, but rail freight service, then you were going to have to go to one of these guys, get on their railroads, and because they owned a local monopoly, you had to pay what they say. Cornelius Vanderbilt, railroad baron. That's what they called him, barons. Financier shipping. You have undertaken to cheat me. I won't sue you for the law is too slow. I'll ruin you. Again, he has no faith in the law. We've seen this again and again and again. He died in 1877 with $96 million, one of the richest men who'd ever lived up to that time. It's really difficult to calculate what a dollar would be, an 1877 dollar would be in America today. Again, there are algorithms that will do that, but it's really, really difficult to, con to, uh, um, to grasp that. But it would be many hundreds of billions of dollars in today's money. Jay Gould, 1836-1892, railroad mogul, financier, market manipulator. He was really bad about that, especially the silver market. Wealth at his death was estimated at $72 million. He died in jail as well. He's going to be like found in all kinds of frauds and all kinds of uh, uh, financing shenanigans. And they're going to finally, they're going to throw him in jail. And while this quote is usually attributed to Boss Tweed, it's actually Jay Gould. I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. So again, this is kind of that Messiah complex. Here's a guy who's like, listen, I make so much money. I'm so filthy, stinking rich. I can do whatever I want to do. The law is not going to stop him because the law is not caught up with industrialization. With all this in mind, let's continue to talk about, um, you know, what's really going on here with the rich rig getting richer. This is the other side of the coin. So Adolphus Bush, he's going to um, revolutionize the beer industry. Uh, for those of you guys who are kind of savvy about this, Adolphus Bush, the company is called Anheuser Busch, and that's Budweiser Beer. So the company that he's involved with, he's not actually a brewer. His dad was, his father-in-law was, the Anheuser side was. He's a businessman. Really quickly. Uh, he's going to take advantage of a new development in railroads, and this is the refrigerated railroad car. Anheuser Busch is located in St. Louis, Missouri, and that is a central location. But because ice had been developed, ice machines have been developed, you can put a compartment of ice in both the front and rear of a box car with ventilation, then put the product in the center. And then as the railroad cars going down the tracks, it will bring in air, run it over the ice, and then in where the product is at. So you could send ice cold beer anywhere in America. Imagine arrived, that stuff arriving in Tucson, Arizona. Everybody wanted it. So he's not personally a brewer. His father-in-law was. Um, but he's a businessman who's taking advantage of changing the markets. And so he turns uh, Budweiser beer into a national beer, and that had never happened. Gustavus Swift, he takes advantage of the same thing, refrigerated railroad cars, and he revolutionizes the meat industry. Very briefly here, uh, again, we've talked about this. Before, beef cattle, also pork, sheep, a lot of people ate a lot of mutton back in those days. Mutton is actually coming back into vogue now. You can get it in the grocery store anytime you want. But any kind of uh, meat like that had to be butchered up at the actual butcher shop. He did that. And he cut up the meat, you know, put it in a cool room if he get his hands on one. But he sold the meat directly to the public because he cut it all up. But all those guts and everything else, the blood would be right there in the city. It was nasty. So Gustav Swift said, well, wait, I know where there's a railroad nexus. There's a place where all the railroads kind of come together, and that's Chicago. So he put in basically a meat disassembly plant just outside of Chicago where all the railroads kind of made met up. Again, it was this big hub. And so it was a big beef disassembly plant, and all the cattle would come in from the plains, get knocked on the head, chopped all the pieces in a big giant factory setting, then put under refrigerated cars, and then sent further east. Another advantage was he had the Great Lakes right there. So 
all winter long, well, this was just a big giant ice machine. It would send hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guys out there out of the Great Lakes to harvest this ice. And they could put that on railroad cars, and there would be enough of it that would last through the summer. And so they had refrigerated railroad cars that would go everywhere. Now, oddly enough, butchers did not like this. They would go to their customers and say, listen, I don't like this because I could go down to the market and pick a cow or a sheep or whatever, a pig, that I know is healthy. I know by looking. And so I'm going to make sure you get the best product. But communities disagreed with the butchers, and they said, no, we don't want all this guts and blood and everything else right in the middle of our cities. So Swift kind of won out in that debate. And so he started making a whole vast treasure of money. It's like, look, if you want beef in your town, you got to pay for you got to pay for that. And so he made a vast treasure of money on this. William Randolph Hearst, uh, publishing. So newspapers, there's two things that are really going on here. Number one, William Randolph Hearst starts in New York, and he starts getting control of some of the New York newspapers. But there's some really, really vicious competition because he can't get control of them all. That's critical. He gets control of the newspaper industry, part of it in New York. The competition is really fierce, so he can't get control of it all. So... Right at just at the turn of the century, he moves his organization to the West Coast. And there, the competition is not so fierce. And so he gets a newspaper monopoly. He relocates to the West Coast and he gets control of all of the newspapers on the West Coast. You know, starting in the South, what, San Diego, then Los Angeles, then San Francisco, that was the big one then Portland, Oregon, and then the Seattle newspapers. And he got control of them all. Now, again, it's hard to convey to you guys today because we have so many other media outlets. But at the time frame we're talking about, the only outlet available to you to get the news was the newspaper. That is it. That's the only way. Radio hadn't been invented yet. No television yet. So he get control of these newspaper, the media outlets, as a monopoly, he can make a vast treasure of money. Another change is uh, the printing process. Intaglio printing had been invented. So you just make one sheet, you put it onto these big giant, you know, uh, you engrave one sheet, you put it on these big wheel devices, and it prints out newspapers by the tens of thousands really inexpensively. Also, you can have more and more illustrations. Uh, cartoons are one of that, and that kind of, that's why I kind of have that picture there. Uh, later on, this will be called Yellow Journalism. It comes from a cartoon called uh, The Yellow Kid, and this is a parody of William Randolph Hearst and some of the other competitors on the Spanish-American War of, 1870, of 1898. And there they are in this, you know, this Yellow Kid suit, and that's their dialogue box. And so we have cartoons. And they can be color cartoons on Sunday. And so because you can have a whole lot of illustrations inexpensively, then that's what everybody wanted. If you had a newspaper that wasn't going to have illustrations, nobody wanted to see it. So Hearst made sure that all of his newspapers were heavily illustrated on every page. Uh, advertisements, you know, lead-in stories. Uh, pictures of individuals that they're writing about, lots and lots of illustrations. And so he had a desirable product that was in much demand, and then he made a monopoly out of it. And he made a vast treasure of money. God knows how much he made. Last but not least, J.P. Morgan is going to revolutionize the banking industry. Before J.P. Morgan came along, banks were basically mom-and-pop organizations, small-time. And they were only as stable as basically the banker could make it. But J.P. Morgan comes along and he's like, nope, we're going to make this industrial. I'm going to have a J.P. Morgan bank everywhere. They're going to be all over the place. And it's going to be hugely stable because I can get a whole lot of money. I can control all that. J.P. Morgan was himself really an unpleasant person. But his idea revolutionized banking. Many of you guys probably have an association with J.P. Morgan today, to this very day. 
if you look at your credit card, you look at your bank organization, it's probably going to say Chase Manhattan on it somewhere. J.P. Morgan Chase was him. That's him. And so it could be that you have a connection with this guy to this very day. That's how big this organization was. To be clear, when Andrew Carnegie sold out in the early 1900s, 1919, I think, J.P. Morgan was able to pay for U.S. Steel by check. He's like, I'm going to buy U.S. Steel, and he did. J.P. Morgan will be instrumental in financing World War I. That's the kind of money we're talking about. He financed the First World War. Britain and France ran out of money pretty quickly, and they came to J.P. Morgan, who said, yeah, but it's going to cost you a lot of money, and we will talk about that later. So the rich are getting fabulously, fabulously wealthy. Strong note now, a huge, unimaginable treasure of money is being made, but it's all in the hands of a very few people. And this becomes highly, highly stressful. So let's continue to discuss this. Real quick on this cartoon, you can see Jay Gould, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, some of these other guys. Uh, they're sitting on big, giant bags full of money. In the foreground uh, is an allegorical image of all these various industries, the cloth industry, linen, the steel industry, iron industry, lumber workers, all these different lumber, all these different uh, um, industries. And that's on the backs of the workers, literally. And what they're holding back is the oceans of hard times. You can see hard times over by that hammer and that pick. And hard times, that's what's happening. And so everybody understood that the rich were getting richer. They're getting fat off the money. Everybody else is working, 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 working. If you'll take a look at, you know, the prices for this, cloth workers of an uh, average $3 a week. Well, that's for children, sure enough. Linen workers, $11 a week. Iron workers, $7 a week. That's a dollar a day. Exactly the kind of money that we've been talking about. So what's important about this particular cartoon? Everybody understood what was going on at the time. None of this is a mystery. The stress on our society was well understood. Let's continue on. I have a summation slide, and then we'll, uh, that'll be the end of part two. So the social situation. This kind of summarizes the center part of progressivism. The political upheaval of Reconstruction, we've talked about that. The Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and all the upheaval of, restruction, of Reconstruction, we've talked about that. 1840s to 1890s, political deadlock, Republicans versus Democrats. We've discussed that. Western migration, shift the political landscape from north versus south to east versus west. We've talked about that with Western migration. And that makes a difference here in industrialization. Wealthy industrialists have no interest in politics. Carnegie didn't go into politics. Rockefeller didn't go into politics. Gould didn't go into politics. None of those guys went into politics. But they got what they wanted. The common man demands political change. These are immigrants, the workers. They want change. They want to end that deadlock. Everybody who writes about this, all the historians that write about this today, they all say the same thing. There was huge deadlock. Increasing immigration. Here are all these people coming in from all over the world. They have high expectations. And then when they arrive in America, it's terrible. It's horrible. Reality is really, really bad. Conditions in the cities are horrible. If you want to go to the West and make out on that land, well, you've got to find a way to get there. You get there, and all the best land is already taken up. And then you work, 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 farm, 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 farm. You make a lot of product, and the par price, farm prices are really, really low. We've talked about that. Harsh working conditions permeate society. So this leads to women's suffrage, labor unions, Grange, which is the organization of the farmers, antitrust movements, widespread public unrest. The social situation, widespread public unrest. All of these things have been going on for a while. They're all going on at the same time simultaneously. The politicians are in it for themselves, and this leads to widespread public unrest. 
So with that in mind, let's just go to the last slide to recap. So towards the 20th century, we're transitioning now to uh, reconstruct. I'm sorry, progressivism, part three of three. Towards the 20th century, the law is not caught up in the industrialization. That's our big idea. To get the law to cut up, we got to put under, everybody under a lot of pressure. We talked about agriculture, industry, labor force. We've talked about immigration. We've talk, talked about politics. They're in it for themselves. We've talked a little bit about economic theory. We'll talk about that more and the ultra rich. In the next slide, we'll talk about economic theory again, and we'll talk about the middle class. They're the dynamo of change. And then finally, the law will catch up with industrialization. So thank you very much for your time and attention here. Uh, I've picked up where part one left off, and I'm leaving you now at the end of part two. So please proceed to part three.